I, I think there's been something lost. I miss you, man. You miss him yeah. sometimes? You call me Ocho Cinco. Do not say Chad. I love that kind of stuff. Come on, man. Miss this thing. You don't want to miss this, huh? Yeah, I think we might have missed it. I'm not sure we miss it. Don't know yet. We're going to find out. What do I miss about football? Well... Simple question, right? Yeah. Maybe not. I think the game... Putting together this list of misses was not a hit at first. But I miss what we had a long time ago. Part, not part of the, uh, the game anymore. anymore. But that never stops us from having fun. Hey, you can't miss them. He gonna miss it. I miss it. You miss the layup. How do you miss that? You miss that. He missed it. Missed it. Missed it. Alas, the art of missing something is no cause for celebration in this show. It's the longing and wistfulness that we were after. Oh, what are you crying? It's all over. All right, we gotta let it go. Tell the boy, just let it go. But this list isn't about moving on. It's about looking back. I yearn for those days when it was, you know, it was just a war before the game started. There's no clutter on the TV. Mud games. Oh, maybe the Houston Oilers. That stupid oil rig on the helmet. I like the daytime Super Bowls. Those games in Pasadena. I think the cheerleaders look better in the sun, too. It seemed that the game itself had more personality. Guys like Fred Bolitnikoff, a guy who just wasn't fast enough, but who had the greatest pair of hands in the world. And why those greatest pair of hands in the world needed to stick them on top of them, I have no idea. The number 10 thing we miss about football, stick em. Yes, I love stick em. It was one of those unique things. It was, you know, it's like a spitball in baseball. You know, it brings a little color to the game. It brings a little excitement. That was fun. That, you see, football back then still had an um, individual feel to it. You could be sloppy or you could be neat. You didn't have to have your socks come to the calf. There wasn't a guy standing on the sidelines marking down all the violations. My good. You, you were able to have some sort of individualism. Part of that was being able to put stick them all over you. First of all, what, what is stick them? What is it made of? They're going to tell you they just call it stick them. It's, it's, it's sticky. Just trust us on this. <laughs> it made for certainly sloppiness. It was, uh, you know, the, the football equivalent of pine tar. In the late 1970s, players sprayed or smeared this sticky substance on themselves for better grip on the ball. Grass would be sticking out everywhere once it got on their hands, and then it would be all the stick them, and Lester Hayes with, you know, his hands, there's stick them, there's grass everywhere. He's catching footballs like this. It was kind of neat. No, I don't miss stick them. I never understood why that was allowed. I mean, that to me is like you're allowed to go up with a cork bat. Yeah, they cheated. They, all the, as a matter of fact, all the little records they were doing that era, those receptions need to be question mark. Fred Bolitnikoff had this stuff everywhere. Yeah, you'd see the insides of their socks. Lester Hayes would stick his hands in his buckets and take them out, and the stick them was all over it. I'm thinking, yuck. But then a ball get caught in there, yeah, you can't get rid of it. In 1980, Hayes led the NFL in interceptions. In 1981, stick them was banned in the NFL. Coincidence? <laughs> getting weird. I mean, you know, like, ball would hit their uniform and stay. I think the NFL did the right thing in banning Stickham when he was, you know, intercepting passes with his elbows. It's unbelievable. But is our Sticky number 10 really gone? You want a Sticky? Sticky. See, I need some Sticky spray, man. I need some water. My hands are Sticky. Balls are Sticky. We got Stickham, man. It's, it's, it's just legal. It's called gloves. They try to hide it in some of the gloves and with the technology of the gloves these days. But I think full-blown sticking where you're sticking your hand in a vat of gooey whatever and going out and trying to catch the ball, I think that's great. I still miss the single bar face mask. How cool were guys like Gary Anderson, Jan Stenerud. He had that sweet one bar. Forevermore, I thought every kicker should have one bar. Even Joe Theismann wearing it as a quarterback. That was cool. 
We will never see that again. The game's too rough, it's too violent. We hear an awful lot of things, Charlie, about football being a fierce and a violent game, and certainly it is. Talk about toughness, because what did a single bar face mask really do to protect anybody? You may as well just take the thing off. Kickers should wear them, though. I mean, kickers, because they don't get touched. I don't know why kickers are given the full gear. I mean, to me, kickers shouldn't even have to wear pads. To be fair, kickers have opted to play with less, where it counted most. The number nine thing we miss about football, barefoot kickers. I think it's hilarious. You look back and you look, and you see guys with just no sock, no shoe, no nothing on, just kicking the ball barefoot. The barefooted rookie kicked one home from 34 yards out. I remember guys stepping out on the turf at the Meadowlands or at Veterans Stadium and thinking, there's no way you could pay me anything in the world. Why aren't they at least taping their foot up? The barefooted kicker will try this one from the eight yard line, left hash mark. In the NFL, shining with one shoe isn't uncommon. It's just improvised. Shoeless Brad Smith with a kickoff return for a touchdown. But depleting oneself on purpose does raise some questions. Why did they do that? Why did they kick barefoot? I don't understand the concept of why a barefoot would have more power on a football than uh, uh, hard leather. And when he put bare toe to rock hard pigskin once more, more good things happen for the hometown boys. Somebody along the way said, if I take my shoe off, I'm going to kick the ball farther. I have no idea how they thought that. Nobody knew if that was true, but you assumed it was true because it's so ridiculous. There has to be an incredibly distinct advantage to, to having a barefoot to kick the ball. Barefoot kicker Tony Franklin stepped into the Eagles' first scoring opportunity. I couldn't kick with a shoe on with near the distance or near the accuracy, and that's the only reason I did it. Tony Franklin certainly influenced me as a, a kicker in college. For me, it was something I learned and then was stuck with. Let's Ouch. The snap, the ball is down, the kick by Carlos. It's going to the Broncos win. Rich Carlos's bare foot was clutch for the Broncos, even in the bitter cold. The things that get cold on you are your feet and your toes and your ears and your nose. That rhymes. Underrated element of toughness to be standing in the cold like that and you have no sock on and no shoe. Opening kickoff, kicks off, no shoe on, and you think, oh my God. Ouch. Ow, that must sting. They're tougher than I am, I know that. I mean, <laughs> that ball hurts in the winter when you have a shoe on, I can only imagine barefooted. I always wonder if those guys got frostbite. Yeah, why don't they have any more barefoot kickers? I, I was wondering about that. Why, it, it, uh, people don't have the guts to try it anymore? Actually, Jeff Wilkins went all natural to start the 2002 season. Here comes the Jeff Wilkins field goal attempt. But after a brief test, he laced up and became the final footnote in barefoot kicking history. You got his shoe on now? It appears he does. It's one of the quirky things of the game that I miss most. I wish this, that number nine is too low on this list. I wish it was higher. I have a soft spot for barefoot kickers. The great thing we miss about football. Angry opponent. I appreciate it, man. I love player, man. Thank you. Way too much love and friendship in today's NFL. What's up, bud? Good. How are you doing, man? Everything good? What up? How you doing? Nowadays, you can see guys basically giving each other high fives for getting through the day. Good luck out there. Yeah. In the 70s and late 60s, you knew who the enemy was. They didn't fraternize before the game. They didn't fraternize after the game. Because a lot of times they had just ended up fighting for 60 minutes. The two contending teams threw footballs and then fists at each other, but Dallas proved the tougher team. I yearned for those days when it was just a war before the game started. I like that because I think it set the tempo for the fans that this is not going to be a friendly match. How about that guy taking a swing, man? I'd fight a man, but I want to play in the second half. I hated the coaches. I hated the ball boys. I hated the cheerleaders. I hated everybody. That's the guy I want on my team. A guy that hates his opponent. 
I want to just let them know that they've been hit. And when they get up, they don't have to look to see who hit them. What is this friendship stuff for? Can't you save that for the tunnel? Or maybe a wave when you're getting on the bus? Cut. Like, I don't want to be friends with anybody when I'm playing football. Nice hit, man. Nick, what's up, brother? Good, good, baby. How you doing, man? I'm all right, man. How you yeah? doing? Good. good. I know one thing that older players really dislike is this brotherhood that takes place on the field that after the game you see players hugging and talking and, 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 and commiserating with each other. God, did you got four picks, though? God, that's a, that's a season for me. Oh, man, you're doing right an awesome yeah, job, all right? right? I know it is, but keep your head up, okay? okay. Good Hold job. Three, man. Good Hold job. Three. Thank you. Thank you. Football is a nasty game, and every one of us that play it, there's streaks inside of us that are not good. How's she feeling? Uh, she's due uh, 18, October 18. You're going to punch a guy in the face and head slap for an NFL game, and then after the game, you're going to hug and kiss and talk about each other's kids? I don't like the kids, man. Good, man. That's cool, man. Good. I absolutely uh, loathe all of that sissy nonsense. There is a lot of lovey-dovey now. Love you, man. Oh, man. As soon as the clock hits zero, these guys come running out from the side, grab each other, find a photographer. I don't know where the photographer's at. And take pictures together the minute the game's over with. Let's get a picture real quick. Hey, man, regardless of where we go, the Bulldogs always bowling. The hugs and high fives among today's players indicate that animosity in the NFL is a lost art. Yo, I want to get your jersey, baby. What I want to do. But for some fans, the absence of angry opponents is just too much to take. Let me get your autograph for my little cub. I don't want friends when I'm playing football. You want to be friends with me? Call me when I get home from the game and I've, I've taken a nap. Hey, your number's still the same? It's still the same, man. Look. All right, I'm going to call you my new number. The Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas, where the Dallas Cowboys collide with the Washington Redskins. Historic venues like the Cotton Bowl just can't compete with today's current cathedrals. What the Roman Coliseum was to the first century is what Cowboy Stadium is to the 21st century. Every time I go into a new stadium, I'm in awe. They are fabulous. They're phenomenal. I love the new stadiums. Even with all the new amenities, some still miss the days of a simple stadium. If you look back at some of the old baseball stadiums and they converted them and they squeezed the football field in there, I don't know, that to me was great. From stadiums to signal calling, the NFL has gone high tech. Got 3Z snag wide cross X0. Even Mother Earth has been upgraded as evidenced by the next number on our list. The number seven thing we miss about football, real grass. You know what I miss about football? Grass. Grass. Remember when teams played on grass? Grass make a big difference. Make a big difference. I love real grass. What's wrong with real grass? That's real football. That's how you was on grass. Feel good, man. There's nothing like some grass stain on the uniform, a little bit of mud. That was dirty. It just looks cool. It feels like football. A little rain, a little mud. Play some ball. For decades, real grass dominated NFL stadiums until landscape upkeep opened the door for an impersonator. <laughs> I'd rather be on grass, though. This new AstroTurf started coming out. Probably something that should have been addressed immediately. Get this crap out of here, because it wasn't meant for football. <laughs> Damn, this paint is hard. Look at these guys looking at this field. You know what happens? When it dries, it starts well, tearing, tearing itself apart there. To fix the tearing, technology gave us field turf. Real grass, it's popular, it's great with the traditionalists, but think if field turf had been around at the beginning of football, real grass probably never would have been on any team's playing surface. We really got to look at putting that high, high, that high turf in. Field turf is pretty darn good because it's softer and it has all of the properties of grass, except you don't have to grow. 
You guys, what, a couple years now you've been with us, right? The turf? Yeah. Way happier with it? Oh, you yeah. got a consistent surface, right? Yeah. Field turf's pretty legit. It, it's it's kind of hard to knock field turf. Well, we'll give it a try. Well, the field turf is weird, and I think most people have never experienced field turf. There are these little, little specks of rubber. I don't know what the purpose of why is there, but it's everywhere. They just put 15,000 pounds of rubber in this baby. You just be running, and someone kicks some little beads up and go in your eye, and then you got to come out for a couple plays. Hey, can you get this out of my eye? It's like uh, the black stuff. How are you going to get that nice green grass stain with field turf? You get, like, the little rubber pellets, but they don't really smudge as well. Hey, you got some grass stains on your ass. The nice thing about real grass is you can at least look at a game and instantly tell who's been playing hard, maybe who hasn't. I mean, real grass tells a story that field turf doesn't say anything. To me, give me grass anytime. You get to see mud and dirt and, and uniforms and grass and helmets, and, and that's what most people grew up with. Get this stuff out of my eye. It's what football was supposed to be played at. Unfortunately, in this day and age, it's not the reality. Field turf is so good that so many teams have gone to it. Now you have all these retractable roofs, these domes. I miss football on grass. That's what I miss. Absolutely. Grass everywhere, as far as I'm concerned. Baseball, football, heck, play basketball on grass. That's why I like playing on grass. The number six thing we miss about football, nicknames. I don't think I'd thought about that. I don't think I'd thought about the fact that we have a severe lack of nicknames now. I mean, we have guys that are, you know, changing their names, changing the back of their jerseys to something that's completely made up, but we don't have real nicknames anymore. We need more player nicknames. There are a couple of good ones now, like Purple Jesus and Pocket Hercules, but we need more nicknames. I got my hair lights on now. Jimmy Smith. Let's go, Jack Smooth. They call me the freak, man. Hey, they call me Sun Jeff, baby. I don't know about I that. Can't, I can't get it now. Number six on our list seems harder to come by as time goes by. The nicknames of the past in the National Football League really described how good a player was or how mean and tough he was. Mean Joe Green. Slinging Sammy Ball, simple, easy. The ghost. Ghost to the post. Nigerian nightmare. Billy White Shoes Johnson. Playmaker. Michael Irvin. Bambi for Lance Allworth, awesome. Minister of Defense, Reggie White, Crazy Legs Hirsch. Dick, Night Train Lane. You know Kenny the Snake State. Broadway Joe. The Purple People Eaters. You know, you had the Fearsome Foursome. You had the, the Sack Exchange with the Jets. You know, the Steel Curtain. Too Tall Jones. He was a, he was a cowboy. And I, you always wondered, like, is he really too tall? I guess Chad Johnson is the ultimate as far as nicknames. He legally got his name changed. Ocho Cinco from now on. Anybody that writes about whatever I say today, you call me Ocho Cinco. Do not say Chad. I think it's silly. I mean, Chad Johnson, I guess, is not that marketable, so Ocho Cinco is. And it was a way to sell more jerseys, because now they say Ocho Cinco on the back. Whatever. Go for it, man. Really. Have at it. It's sort of not playing by the rules if the players pick their own nickname. Pac-Man Jones decided he was Pac-Man Jones and we should all call him Pac-Man Jones and then he decided when he came back with Cincinnati that he was not Pac-Man Jones and we should stop calling him Pac-Man Jones. You've got to earn a nickname and when you give it to yourself, forget about it. That's, that's, that's amateur hour at the Apollo. Everybody wants to see what T.O. gonna do this week. We are getting lazy. I, I hate the T.O. thing. The nicknames now, they're just not clever, they're just initials. JG. He's good. Hey, TD. Give it to LT and he'll convert it. LT should have been Lawrence Taylor forever in perpetuity. And we need no more nicknames where you take the first letter of a guy's first name and the first syllable of his last name and make that a nickname. Aaron Rodgers is not a rod. It's no B Mo. People call Steven Jackson S. Jax. I heard someone refer to Vincent Jackson as V Jax. I'm like, well, is that really a nickname? V Jax? Give me a break. I get a real nickname. That's not a nickname. That's a shortening. It's a different thing. I can't stand fake nicknames. I hate them. Give me a real nickname. They call me Foo. You know what they call me Foo? 
I drank a lot of beer. My eyes would get squinty. I look like a Chinese guy. They call me Fu. Anybody who calls me Fu, I know is in the NFL. They drank a beer with me at one time in my life. I like that. And now, the number five thing we miss about football. Goalposts on the goal line. Every time I watch old film with the goalpost that's up and I see a guy going in, I cringe. I don't know how they did that. You know, I don't know how you can run a route when there's a pole in the field. I don't, I don't know how you do that. I don't think I'd be able to play. I know the football follies people miss goalposts on the goal line. Can you ever not laugh at somebody running full speed into anything? It made for the best comic relief in NFL history. I thought it raised a degree of difficulty for everybody. Certainly, it was entertaining to have the goalpost there, and everybody ran into that thing. Goalposts have been a part of football since the game's inception, but the original location of the uprights was a bit odd. Right at the goal line, you have this huge metal spike on the field with some padding on it, which wouldn't protect most things. I remember when there were two goalposts. They were two poles and then the crossbar. Oh, it was totally a different game back then. As much as the old goalposts were once obstacles. Oh, that guy's hurt bad. They often provided an occasional advantage. Sometimes, if a receiver was good, he would use the goalpost to shield himself from the defender. It was fun to watch, you know, guys using it as a pick and all that other stuff. But on some passing plays, the number five thing we miss presented a problem. That might just be the Super Bowl for 1972. Late in Super Bowl VII, Billy Kilmer clanked the pass off the upright and the Dolphins finished the season undefeated. I, I thought it was the greatest thing when they finally said, get these things, they're turned away. And this year, Tom, we might even have more great action because there have been some changes made in the NFL. In 1974, goalposts were pushed back for good. Gone were the goofy collisions, but game planning got a whole lot harder. I don't know whose idea it was to move the goalpost back. The only ones that probably hated are two people. The coach who had to, to decide to kick a game-winning field goal that was now 10 yards further back. And they tried and tried and missed and missed. As an ex-field goal kicker, I can testify that it was probably a combination of pressure and early season jitters that caused all those missed field goals. Tougher for kickers, tougher for coaches, certainly much better for linebackers or running backs from running into the goalposts. Today, goalposts still stand off the playing field, but players continue to keep them in the game. Joe Horn had a cellular phone hidden underneath the goalpost. I think the goalposts in the front of the end zone should come back. That would make for some great drama on Sundays if guys started running into goalposts again. Boom, the guy, boom, falls down. I think we need more booms. We got no booms. All we got now is when the guy jumps in the stands in Lambo. Put the, put the post back up so we can have some booms. The number four thing we miss about football, real fullback. That should be number one. What's happened to today's fullbacks? They've been phased out. You know, now it's, you know, we'll just find a big athlete with no neck and we'll make him a pulling guard in the backfield. Hey, I'll play fullback. B.J. Raji in a fullback. I think the truly good teams that normally survive, Pittsburgh usually has a, a guy that can block. The Jets had two fullbacks on the roster throughout the year. I want to see Connor hit somebody. If you want to go all the way, those short yardage situations define what a fullback's importance is. And that's what good running teams do. We're going to go to our fullback. Every team needs a fullback. Now, you might not need them all the time, but at least four or five times a game, you wish you had a Sam Gash on your football team. Better yet, how about Larry Zonka? To me, the golden age for fullbacks, Norm Boulash, Larry Zonka, and Don Nottingham. It, it will never get any better than those three guys. And there was something, there was a mystique about a fullback position back then. It used to be the glamour position. I mean, Jim Brown, a lot of people referred to him as a fullback. 
I'm his real fullbacks like Jim Taylor. Jim Taylor would run at Packers Sweet for Vince Lombardi. He was tough. Daryl Moose Johnston used to get moose calls even when he didn't touch the ball. That's how appreciated his lead blocking prowess was. Everybody loves the big guy that runs over people. Mike Allstott, Tom Rathman, are you kidding me? Touchdown Tommy Vardell. I miss those guys. Lorenzo Neal was the last of the great real fullbacks, but also showed why they're number four on this list. There was one time I saw Lorenzo Neal in Baltimore, caught a pass in the flat, turned backward to headbutt a guy to block him. He wouldn't run because he loved to hit, but also because he couldn't run. You trying to get over a thousand yards, and you know <laughs> you only needed 983. Today, no fullback knows how to run football. And I'm glad the fullback's kind of disappearing. If it's first down and a fullback's lined up, you're just instantly waiting for second and ten. Do I like to see a, go to, a, a fullback go blast in his face right in there? Yeah, I, th I think that's pretty cool, but I don't think we're going to see it anymore because you just don't score fast enough with a fullback in the game. Leather helmets, they need to bring those back, right? You get, you get a little bit more face time as an NFL player. Those are pretty sweet. Old headgear did not make our list, but we do miss the simple look that once accompanied it. I'm holding you personally responsible for making me look like the Kool-Aid man. <laughs> like a bunch of popsicles out there. Today's fashion faux pas and ever-evolving uniforms give the classic look an honorable mention on our list. How ugly oh. that is. Oh, yeah. For a lot of these teams, they change uniforms every two years. And you have the retro uniforms, you have the once-a-year uniforms, you have the all-black uniforms. There's too many uniforms. There's a lot going on during a football game, and now i got to figure out which team is wearing what. Really? Light blue and yellow? Oh, that's our team? Keep my team in a uniform that I can understand. And keep the quarterback in charge. The number three thing we miss about football. Quarterbacks following their own play. This is basically NFL coaches saying, I don't trust my most important player enough to play his position. I have to do it for him. Get ready to run this gun wide punch right, dash right. You all right with that call? If you got a good quarterback, he ought to be the guy calling the plays. He's the guy who's feeling it, seeing it. Uh, all right, what else do you have? have something else. He knows what he's got to run. He knows what his personnel groupings are. He knows what he has to do against the defense. When we huddle, we can run the ball a little bit more effectively. All this micromanaging of coaches. Can't hear. Come here, shuttling guys in and out. Just let the guys play. They know what they're doing. What happened in the old days when a quarterback used to own the huddle? The quarterback was a more romantic position when they gave you that power. Johnny Unitas called all his own plays in that famous two-minute drive of the 1958 championship game. Unitas calling out the signal. Joe Namath in Super Bowl three, he didn't have that great a game. You know, when you look at the numbers and he didn't throw for that many yards and all that, but he called the game and that's what made it special. I would have got you in the middle tank, but I wanted to go in at 37 feet. Johnny Unitas, not being allowed to call his own, own plays, he wouldn't hear of such a thing. And number one, Johnny Unitas would never wear a color-coded wristband. Watch the maestro Unitas. Number two, he would find a way to somehow uh, dissemble the microphone. He'd tell the coach, hey, man, I see you're coming in crackly. I can't hear a word you're saying. But all those old guys would. Jurgensen would have laughed. And Jurgensen, whenever George Allen did send a play in for him, Jurgensen would say, nah, I'm not going to call that. Much uh, of the reason he didn't play a lot for George Allen. Surely there must be some modern day exceptions to number three on our list. Run, 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 run. Oh, no. I love watching Peyton Manning because he is basically calling his own plays. I might all of them. I'll use, I'll use Brown. When he does it, it's turned into a uh, football opera. The way he reads defenses and he's pointing and he's backing up and he's switching up and he's calling different plays. He's going to wind up calling the play that puts them in the best position. So if you have the right quarterback, I think there's still uh, a little bit of room for wiggle there. And if you don't...
some of them are, you know, I wouldn't let them call, you know, a cab, much less a play. Could you imagine how funny it would be if Jamarcus Russell was calling his own plays? But you still have to be aware they were coming, get rid of that ball. You can't take a, a sack when you have great field position like that. Now, quarterbacks, you get the sense that when their helmets go out, that they have no idea what to do. What happened? They're just like frozen, you know, like a like a computer that just kind of just got stuck. Third down, what was it? No, before. It seems technology is to blame for number three on our countdown. I like the coach yelling at you in Dolby Digital. All this control, they got big giant dots on the back of their helmet. They got electrodes shooting through their brain. They got surround sound in here. So many people making decisions anymore. Coaches staring and hiding their mouth. One of these days I'm going to get a bad call and I'm just going to rip it all out and make a big ceremony and just throw all of it all over the place. The game has become so technical and uh, you can see right after four plays are done they're looking at the plays. Let me see that last picture. That's a good look though. They're showing the quarterback, hey, this look, look what happened. But we made it that way. We made it that way where you now have these tactical geniuses up on top. What are you saying up there? This is the babying of the most important position on the field and it should stop. Let these guys call their own plays. Peyton Manning can do it. He can't possibly be the only quarterback in the 21st century who can call his own plays. Things are always new and different at halftime of an NFL football game. Remember when halftime entertainment was actually entertaining? Nowadays, a regular season midway session is all about reunions and rings of honor. And today's honoree, the second man ever inducted into the ring of honor. While the Super Bowl is an exception, the fun of finding any given talent on any given Sunday seems gone forever. In Green Bay, they had the Markuku Siamese twin sisters as halftime performers. With this ring, I be wed. I now pronounce you to be husband and wife. Missing all of this miscellaneous fun wasn't good enough to crack our top ten. But football longings from the land of entertainment were strong enough to ice the next spot on our list. The number two thing we miss about football, the NFL in L.A. I envy whichever team gets back there. Los Angeles is a sun-kissed world of unabashed hedonism, sandy beaches, and the glitz and glamour of the entertainment industry. This is the greatest area to be a professional football player. Whichever team moves to SoCal, uh, I really hope they lose. <laughs> I do, I do, because we can't do it. Because we couldn't win there, and we were the LA Rams. Once upon a time, Los Angeles had two NFL teams, the L.A. Rams and the L.A. Raiders. I would love to see the Los Angeles Rams back. There's just so much history there, whether it was the late 60s Rams with the Merlin Olsons and Deacon Jones and all that fearsome foursome and all that, or the Vince Ferragamo Rams that just kind of came out of nowhere and all that, or, or even like the late 80s Eric Dickerson Rams. Dickerson breaks for the 40, 35, 30. I lived in Lipstick City for a long time, and I used to go to Rams games. I used to go to Raider games. That was great stuff. Touchdown, Los Angeles! He makes a one-handed catch! Touchdown, Raiders! The Raiders even won their third Super Bowl during their SoCal stay. Just win, baby. <laughs> St. Louis is a big league town. Following the 1994 season, L.A. lost both of its NFL teams, creating an outcry that has endured for nearly two decades. It's Los Angeles. It's supposed to have all of the major sports. It's the second largest city in America. Kids have grown up in that town. The boat's been missed of a whole couple of generations now that haven't had football. That's sad. Even with all the longing for the NFL in L.A., some feel the number two thing we miss may have missed the mark. I'm not sure we miss it. 
I'm not sure we miss it. People in Los Angeles don't seem to miss it. Every time I talk to anybody out there, they're like, oh, it's great. We get whatever game we want on TV. We don't even need, we don't need to go to the games. Their fans decided that it was no longer fashionable to be seen at a Rams home game. When the Raiders were there and the Rams were there and the teams were not very good, you'd get forced to watch bad games on TV. We're going to switch you now to Mile High Stadium in Denver. And now that switch was going on for part of the country. The rest of you will stay here. The Rams lose their fifth in a row. Most for better days ahead. Figuring out how to get football back in L.A. isn't easy, but most agree it's well overdue. The NFL belongs there. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much of an aura there that just seems to fit. I think all of our big cities in this country should have a team. And I can guarantee you that uh, Roger Goodell will bring football back to Los Angeles. It will happen. It'd be great to have them meet again at the altar and finally make it there. Los Angeles and football is a marriage that needs to be reunited because it feels so good we need it because we miss the Rams, we miss the Raiders, we'd love to have them back and the city is nine for football. And now, the number one thing we miss about football, well-dressed coaches. We call this guy the, the man in charge. He's leading the team. He's the boss. Well, look like a boss. Pullover sweaters and hoodies and stuff like that doesn't do it for me. Normally they don't make it into the material. I feel like I'm kind of in my shower clothes. Well, if coaching doesn't work out, you can you can go to the Colonnades Beach Hotel and be a you know sure. work the cabana. Coaches should be wearing the jackets and ties. It's the right look for the sideline. You can't separate the head coach anymore. I like knowing who's in charge. You look on the sideline now and you have no idea who the head coach is. Back in the day it was pretty easy to pick him out. He was the guy with the fedora and the black jacket. I remember growing up as a kid and watching Tom Landry with the fedora. He looked so sharp on the sidelines. He added that elegance, that grace, that class to a game. Think of George Hallis, that overcoat, that hat, you know, Lombardi out there with his camel-haired coat and he wore that crazy little hat going nuts. What are you doing? I'll tell you something, Leroy, you're not going to get your job back unless we get a better performance. Would anyone look slicker than my man Hank Stram? Not only was he styling, but he had the sweet chief, the handkerchief sticking out always. And then he rolled up the media guide, but his hair never moved. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. He could have gone out after the game and had a stogie and a nice glass of, of vintage Cabernet Sauvignon and a steak somewhere right from the field. I just think that Tom Landry and Paul Brown lent an air of dignity and intelligence to the game that a man in a hooded sweatshirt just doesn't do. You look at Belichick. I mean, the guy looks like he's going to Rikers Island in that outfit. Like he just got picked up for a DUI. I mean, somebody tell this guy to clean up his act. What, what Bill Belichick is saying on the sidelines constantly with the with way he dresses is, I, I haven't left the office in, you know, 12 years. And and that's okay. But then everybody started, started doing it. So now it's just a bunch of guys who, like, just got out of bed and they're still wearing their pajamas. I mean, that's all you have. To be fair, some recent coaches have gotten more than a few buttons away from stylish. Mike Nolan had it right a couple years ago when he went to coach San Francisco 49ers to honor his father. Put him in the suits. But I don't necessarily want to see Rex Ryan walking around in a really, really loose and baggy blue blazer with an Oxford shirt. It would be big and floppy and it, there'd be mustard stains on it. No, we don't We don't really need to see that. Oh, I love the idea of Rex Ryan in an ill-fitted suit. I'm paying to get in there to see that. You just look it out there and you think that's how I look in a suit. Put a suit on somebody and a tie on somebody, no matter how they're shaped, no matter what they look like, they, they look dressed for success. And I don't give a darn if that means that Reebok pays $10,000 less or $10 million less to the NFL because the coach isn't wearing some sweatshirt with the logo on it. The upgrade in dignity would far outweigh the loss of revenue. I think coach is missing the boat. I mean, you know, let's face it, Tom Landry 
not the most interesting guy in the world, but we had the hat. Bum Phillips was a very interesting guy, but without the cowboy hat, it doesn't work. You know, it's, what do I know about John Fox? I don't know anything about John Fox, but John Fox is wearing a hat. Todd Haley in Kansas City, that's a guy, even if nobody else dresses up, he should just dress up. That could be two or three more wins for the Chiefs. But if coaches suit up again, years from now, we would probably make a show about missing messy coaches. Why? Why? It's okay. It's all right. We're good. Don't worry about it. This is ridiculous. Upgrades, innovations, and relocations will always be changing the sport of football. How do they renovate the stadium? They don't fix the locker room. And I want it friggin' fixed. Although improving the game is always the goal, we're often left wanting it just the way it was. Let me play my game. Why do you guys try to change me? It's like my wife. 